Hi everyone, now we're going to be moving on to a different form of therapy, occupational therapy. And before we get too far, I just need to clarify things. So occupational therapy might have something to do with your job, but it is not some sort of thing that's directly related to a job, okay? I realize you might be thinking, hey, I'm retired. I don't need occupational therapy. What is this? So just know that occupational therapy, I actually refer to them more as home safety specialists. They're in the medical field. They're licensed, okay? They go hand in hand in a lot of ways with physical therapy. There's a lot of good things they can do, and I'm not going to spoil the video for you, but just don't rule out these occupational therapists, I'll just tell you one of the things they can do. And that is that they can come into your house, if you're open to that idea, they can do these home assessments. They're qualified to kind of go through things with you in your house that will be troublesome or become a dangerous issue for you. So obviously, you know, you don't want that problem. And if we're serious about fall prevention and walking better, why don't we think about our house? Because that's where a lot of the falls happen is in people's homes. These kind of folks, they're great for you to consider. You might be thinking after watching these videos now, hey, you know what? Why hasn't anybody ever told me this stuff sooner? And I'm not taking a jab at anyone that you've worked with in your past, but I can tell you that these things exist. And in my mind, I'm wondering why they don't come up all the time. So it's my job to bring it to you and try to help you with this because now you can see why I'm talking about this self-advocacy stuff, right? Because if you don't ask for it, you might not be given this as an option by the medical professionals you're seeing. And I don't know why. I just don't know why. So so if you ask for it, you know, your doctor is not going to tell you no on these things, okay? In a moment here, we're going to be talking about occupational therapy, but we got to just get back to why we're doing all this stuff. Let's draw a line in the sand, okay? Let's think about your routines every day. We need to do things differently if you're going to get different outcomes. If you haven't talked to your doctor about this yet, tell your doctor, you know what? I want a script for this custom walking aid known as an AFO. Go to an orthotist and they can help me with that. I want a script for physical therapy or I don't know if they give scripts for yoga or personal training or Pilates or whatever the case is. You can still put that on your agenda, right? So the top three here would be the custom walking aid, physical therapy, and or these other forms of exercise and also occupational therapy, perhaps just for a home assessment or additional occupational therapy. These three things right here it can change the game for you and that's what you deserve to have happen you got to keep moving forward with this you won't get anything just because you want it you still need to put in some work for this stuff to get this good things are supposed to happen to you i would love to hear you say that out loud to yourself good things are supposed to happen to me this is what is going to work for me i'm going to get the custom walking aid I'm going to try the physical therapy like Dan's talking about. I'm also going to try this occupational therapist. You know, home assessment, if you had those people to your house, they could show you stuff that you probably haven't thought of. They can give you strategies in your home that can help you. And if you're serious about this, you don't want to have another fall to be then motivated to do this stuff. Let's get it out of the way now. Just remember this, the change won't happen if we don't take action. Let's not hope this something changes or wish that something can change in your life, okay? Instead, let's approach this differently. You need to accept Expect to be more successful in this regard. Let's make these changes. Your behavior is key to this whole process. Again, also let's take notes because then you can share that with your occupational therapist. If you expect to see positive results and changes with your actions, things will start to change for you. One of the things I want you to think about when you're listening to these videos, okay, or you're gonna do something after this particular video, think to yourself, yes. You got to envision this stuff. I have a vision for my success here. Don't see yourself as a person who's just going to give up now. We don't want to just listen to these videos and have a smile on our face. We want to do something about this. Have a vision that you're going to keep going with these keys and bring them to life. Know where you're headed. That's so important. Where you're going is so important. Have a vision in your mind. You're going to do these three things. If it was just these three things, this can change the game for you. The cane is not equal to these things at all, and hope is not either, okay? These medical professionals that I'm talking to you about can change the game for you. Don't listen to naysayers in your life that say, oh, I tried occupational therapy and it didn't work for me. I can tell you that 90% 90, 90 of the people that you're going to meet with walking problems, they are not going to be learning the stuff that you're learning right now. Just think about your emotional home here. What is it like in your house today? Do you have fear? You don't deserve to have that happen, so let's do something about this. Let go of the silly stuff that's trying to block 
you from your improvement. If you do what everyone else is doing around you, you like usually getting those walking canes and just hope things get better or being someone who's just going to sit all the time, that's what's going to happen to you. You can do this. Let's keep moving forward. Now, here is the compilation with Samantha and Rachel. They can tell you a lot of great things about what an occupational therapist can do for you. And then we're going to move on later to some great information from a woman named Brittany. Brittany has done many videos with us and she can also teach you about occupational therapy. But just one thing to start here. Just remember, this has nothing to do with work as far as a job, occupational. When they refer to occupations, that means things you do in your daily life, your daily occupations. So that could be cooking, cleaning. How am I going to do that better? How am I going to get in and out of a chair better? How am I going to get in and out of a car better? All of those things matter for you. And if you want success with this, you got to focus in on some of this stuff. Without further ado, let's move forward and let's listen to this next compilation with Samantha and Rachel. Can you talk about what the role is of an occupational therapist in general? And so an occupational therapist is someone that can help you with anything that you want or need to do in your everyday life. But the That may be learning new skills, maintaining old skills, relearning those skills if you knew them before. But we try to use the occupations that that are important to you. So and that's kind of our main perspective, always applying what we're doing to those activities that are important to you. Mm -hmm. So that's different from PT, where I would say they are the gait expert. They are going to work on strength, balance, gait or walk, gait is walking, where we would maybe also be working on those things, but we'd be doing that so that you can get back to cooking in your kitchen. They also have that goal in mind, but we're just, we're looking at it through a different lens, a different perspective. It's more situational for life. We're looking at it with that lens. Yeah. It, okay. If we can't apply it to some uh, an occupation that's important to you, then we probably shouldn't be doing it. Yes, you may come in and see that we're working on upper extremity stretches, but why? We may be trying to get you back to being able to dress yourself or to help engage in play with your grandchildren. So we're always just relating it to those occupations or your activities of daily living. So when you say occupations, you really, to someone who doesn't know what you know, that just means activities of daily living that you're doing per day. Yes, thank you. Things. Yeah. Right. Yep. So that could be getting dressed. That could be going to the grocery store. That could be paying bills. Everything you do in daily living, going okay. to your job, things like that. Can you describe just really quickly the difference between the profession of being an occupational therapist and a physical therapist? So a lot of times we do very similar interventions, but the main difference is that occupational therapists focus on everything that occupies your time. So that could be anything from getting ready for the day, going to the bathroom, all the way through cooking, cleaning, and even driving. So we are really focused on getting you back to doing those things, whereas physical therapists focus more on the physical aspects and the mobility aspects. Can you name some of those activities that would be important to someone who has foot drop or who falls. It would be getting from probably the bedroom to the bathroom. Yes. So we see a lot of patients who have fallen due to foot drop. Going to the bathroom is a big one. Getting in and out of the shower is another big one. Even things like going out to the community, going grocery shopping, that's a lot of walking. So sometimes they might have foot drop where They're able to get to and from the bathroom with no problem. They're able to get around their house. But the foot drop limits them in longer distances because they get tired. The ways that they're compensating and using other muscles um, can really impact their ability to complete those tasks. So we call them mobility-related ADLs, which is activities of daily living. So that can be anything that you need to do or want to do during the day that directly relates to mobility, which is a lot of things in our life. Getting around your home is important. If you can't do that, you're not going to do your occupation. So that might be recommending a tub bench or grab bars in the showers by your toilets, railings to get into the house, things like that. So occupational therapists in general go into the home or do you ever personally, because I know that's like a real specific Mm -hmm. part of occupational therapy and maybe not every occupational therapist has that quote unquote credential. Do you ever go into homes and give advice on that kind of stuff? 
Correct. Not every OT will, but we're all trained on it. I've gone into the home in different settings, in multiple different settings. I think it is so important to work with someone in their own environment, because if you're working with them in the clinic, it's still good. But to generalize it is is more difficult to see what they're actually working and dealing with at home is you'll sometimes get a whole different story or perspective, I should say. So you can't just give me somebody a top five or 10 list. It just really case by case. There probably is some generalities, but it's not good to approach it that way. Is that what you're saying? Correct. Yeah. And you really don't know until you go in. I think we have a trained eye for it and different perspective. I could get, I gave the five probably most common adaptions we give, but there can be so many, like if they have back pain, they may want to, we'll, we'll see, oh, you, you do a lot of picking up your shoes from the floor, can we move these to a higher location? So even changing little things like that, we may not know, realize they're doing so much until we get there. What would an occupational therapist say to someone who is curious about being more safe going from the bedroom to the bathroom? We do have a couple of things that we recommend to every single patient almost. And one of them would be non-slip footwear and making sure you have something on your foot that won't slip. I think a lot of people think that you know, their bare feet are more sturdy than they really are. Having that footwear on can really make the difference between if you step on something such as a towel or a piece of tissue paper that may have fallen on the floor, or even a rug that might not be nonstick. And that footwear can really make a huge difference in preventing the fall. But additionally, we always recommend turning on lights, especially if it's at night, making sure that the area is very highly visible that you can see where you're going and where every step of your foot is being placed because it only takes one second for your foot to not be where you thought it was or to be stepping on something that you didn't think was there for a fall to happen. What else would you say? So in the bathroom, you said the bathroom's very important. Can you talk a little bit more about that when it comes to falls? Sure. So the number one place for falls is in the bathroom. So that could be the shower, it could be going to the toilet, it could be getting ready for the day. But in general, the bathroom is the most dangerous place in your home. But you don't think about it because when you're going to the bathroom, either you're using the shower and it's wet and slippery, or you are going to the bathroom and maybe you're rushing. Maybe you have to go to the bathroom and you're not thinking about all the safety things that you think about when you're maybe just leisurely going to sit in a chair or make yourself a meal. It can be a lot more of an immediate experience. The other thing that we see is that there are a lot of rugs in the bathrooms. So throw rugs are another thing that we do recommend taking up. It can be helpful when you first come out of the shower to have a non-slip mat in there. But taking that up when you're not showering can be really helpful as well. Because again, if you're not looking for that, you're not thinking about it, maybe have been or you're starting to use an assistive device such as a rolling walker, that rug can be a really big tripping hazard more than you probably realized, you know, maybe before things have changed for you. I think the easiest thing that anyone can do who's worried about falls is to take, especially those rugs off the floor. Everyone loves rugs, but if there's not that anti-slip grip on the bottom of it. You really don't need it. You can either go get the anti-slip grip or buy rugs with that, especially in your bathroom where the surfaces are going to get wet after you get out of the shower. I think that's the easiest thing that everyone could do if you're worried about falls and the quickest without spending money, unless you want that anti-slip grip. Can you clarify that for me? So I'm thinking it's its own thing, or does that go underneath like a rug? Is that what you're saying? So the rug doesn't slip? Correct. You so can, the person doesn't slip on the floor. So you can buy the, it's kind of like a grippy, just slip that will go under any of your rugs if you don't want to get rid of something you already have. Otherwise, they sell rugs specifically to not slip. But it's okay. amazing. I go into homes and there's so many that are just decorative. And AKA throw rugs, is that what you're? Yeah. Okay. What would you say to someone who is searching for maybe one of these rugs that don't slip? What do they call that? Anti-slip rug? Is it that simple? Yeah. It's usually in the the search you're doing. Or if you go to like a Bed Bath & Beyond, they'll be able to help you target. Uh, They all have them. So anything else inside the home? I I think grab bars are a good idea. Do you agree with that? Yes. And it depends, you know, on the size of your bathroom as well, if we're talking about the bathroom specifically. Because sometimes they, if you have a nice wide open space, 
there is something called a safety frame. So it's ground bars that attach to the back of the toilet seat. Um, oh. So that if you don't have an, you know, a wall or, or a cabinet nearby where you can easily attach those grab bars, it's another option. But if it's a narrow space, so those can be, become more clutter. So you got to think about adding things to your bathroom could become another area where you could trip over. Safety frame. So that's good unless you trip on the safety frame. Right. Saying. Okay. Right. And I wonder if that, do you hear about people tripping on those or? You hear about everything. I will be honest with you. I would be surprised oh. over what people trip over. So that's why you may never would have thought that that bar sticking out on the side. But say you're going to the trash can, you're trying to throw something away and you're trying to get around that frame. If it's a cluttered environment as it is, then that gotcha. makes a big difference. Yeah. Gotcha. So just thinking gotcha. about those things and, and trying to you know utilize your space wisely. I think it's okay. important as well. So there's a safety frame for the toilets. What about like grab bars in the shower? Do you have any thoughts on that? Yes. Personally, talked to one contractor, but we've been trying to work with contractors. They have their ADA specifications for where oh. the grab bars should go. But one thing that we do notice is that they always want to put the grab bar in the shower, which is really helpful when you're already in the shower. But to get in and out of it, it's really helpful to have a grab bar right at the edge of the shower so that you can use it to get in and out. Especially so, if it's a tub combination shower. So just outside and then one inside, one mm -hmm. and one, or do you do yeah. more than one or do you would like, you know, I, I suppose you could do anything you want. Yeah. I mean, it depends on how much money you want to spend on these adaptations, yeah. but when you're thinking yeah. about your safety, you know, these are small prices to pay compared to having a fall. Um, mostly what I recommend to my patients is putting it actually right inside the shower. So if you have like the shower wall, if this is the tub, you want to put it right inside the shower so that it's there when you go to step in, but it's also inside the shower so that when you're in there, you can use it to stand up from a chair or to hold on to, to wash your feet. That way it kind of serves both purposes. Okay. Um, but it's also better, you know, to make sure that if you're going to sit in the shower, you think about that, you know, making sure that the grab bar is accessible from that seated position. Um, so you may, in that case, need to have one inside and one outside the shower. Gotcha. So let's talk about that sitting part of this, if you don't mind. I'm trying to put myself into this position. When you sit, you use a shower chair, right? So would you want one lower too? Or or that all-in-one, you try to just find the best spot for the all-in-one. A lot yeah. of times, you know, I'm trying to save my patients money. It's not, you know, you don't want to have me putting grab bars everywhere and spending unnecessary money. So we do try to find one good place for a grab bar if possible. Okay. Uh, but if you are sitting, either the grab bar has to be long enough where it's still accessible from a seated position, or you have to have two grab bars, one where you can reach it when you're standing and one closer to you when you're sitting. Can you talk about shower chairs versus uh, shower benches? So it really depends on how high you're able to flex your hip and bend your knee. Because if you have a tub combination shower with that higher threshold that you really have to take a big step over, then a tub bench goes over the tub. So you never have to step over that threshold, which makes that risk of falling very low it does sit outside the tub. So again, thinking about your space and how narrow it is, if that's going to become a tripping hazard, if it's right next to the toilet and you're trying, you can't fit your walker in there anymore. So uh, uh, it really depends on the space and, and your physical abilities to step over a threshold of that height. Now, if you have a walk-in shower, I would recommend a shower chair because that will allow you more space in there to get in and out. Um, less clutter in the environment, um, and it reduces the risk of water falling onto the floor. So with the bench, I do teach my patients to cut like a cheap shower curtain liner and put it down um, in between the tub bench slots. Um, if you get a tub bench, it comes with like three parts to the seat. So okay. you can actually kind of get it down in there to make sure the water doesn't pour off the side. Because if we're talking about falls, a wet, slippery, foul floor, is going to be a you know, pretty high false risk. So when you're talking about different equipment, it's really important to really consider one, your space, two, your type of shower, the so people walk in or a tub shower, and then your physical abilities to get over whatever the threshold you have. Okay. 
Anything else in the bathroom or would you move on to another area that's a big concern in the house? Uh, maybe the garage, I think, did you say earlier? Or the kitchen? Any specific thoughts on those areas? Yeah, the kitchen for sure. Definitely looking at clutter in that area and rugs. A lot of people with throw rugs again in the kitchen. If you are using an assistive device, just thinking about getting that assistive device over the threshold between the regular floor and that rug, if you have one in there. And then okay. if you have foot drop, like we were talking about earlier, you know, making sure that, that your foot is clearing that rug every time. If you're going about your business and making your lunch in your own home, you're comfortable. You may not think about the fact that that foot is dragging and hitting that that rug. So rugs are a big one in the kitchen. Gotcha. It seems like they're big everywhere. I mean, yeah. we just left a room and now we're, and then the rugs are key again. Yeah. Okay. And what about the garage? So probably grab bars or handrails. Would you always recommend a double handrail? Because a lot of times people probably have their hands full and they might not be thinking which hand they're holding things in. Maybe they do. I don't know. It, it depends on your situation. I think a lot of times double handrails are recommended if you're going to put one in to go ahead and do both of them just because you know, eventually if anything were to happen, if you were to become a weaker or again, your reaction time decreases, you end up with foot drop. Having those two bars to really pull on can be essential. Okay. Then talking about having things in your hand, you know, always making sure that, you know, if you need to get a tote bag that goes over your shoulder so that you can use both hands or even a backpack or have some of my patients just use a backpack to get their groceries inside. Okay. Uh, or asking for assistance if you need it to make sure that you can use your hands if you need both of them to get up the stairs. Okay, so you concentrate on also teaching people to think about freeing up their hands. That's good. I can see the value. I don't always think about that. So that's that's probably a great therapy conversation point, I would imagine. Yeah. So so tote bags or backpacks is what you're saying. And it doesn't yeah, necessarily something that it. takes it out of your hands, you know, assistance if you if you have it there. And then thinking about there are little like grocery bags on wheels, something like that. So at least you can have one hand free and carry a large chunk of your groceries in at one time. So there are kind of different items you could buy, but a lot of people just have a you know, over the shoulder tote bag or a backpack lying around. So it's really easy option to free up your hands or if you were to stumble a little bit that it doesn't turn into a bolt ball you can catch yourself grab onto the handrail use those reactions that your body naturally has any thoughts on handrails yeah i think that's huge just for i mean most of our homes that are built are built with many steps to get in and out so without that it really leaves you kind of balancing on one foot to get from step to step. And that can be a huge disadvantage of someone who has reduced balance. So without that extra support, I've seen people use the the door itself for support and that's, that's dynamic, mm -hmm. that moves. So that's a big area for fall risk if you don't have those handrails to support you. Think about it, if you're going up steps, you have to lift up one foot. So you're only balancing on one foot at a time and without something, another arm to help you balance, it really puts you at a disadvantage. Usually you'll need a script from a doctor for an OT home assessment, but it's frequently given after like a discharge from a hospital or a skilled nursing facility, wherever, whenever they're going to discharge home. So that frequently happens, but the doctor is usually the one to initiate it after they hear maybe some concerns of balance or strength at home, especially for people who live alone and don't always have someone in the home with them. Right after a fall, what's being told to people about fall prevention from an occupational therapist point of view? So you mainly want them to feel confident to know what to do, because usually what do people do after they fall? They they panic. So actually, after a fall, you want to kind of assess the situation and stay calm, which I know is very hard to do, but you really need to assess for pain because you could injure yourself further by getting up quickly, or if you sustained like a spinal cord injury, you could definitely injure yourself more by moving quickly and getting up, or you could get up too quickly and be dizzy. And then again, you could cause another fall. So that's the first thing you kind of want to let people know and educate them is just to kind of assess the situation. Hopefully they're with someone or have a cell phone nearby where they can call for help. It's amazing to me that people are far more likely to, have, you've probably heard this too, fall inside their home 
we get comfortable in our own home and it just seems second nature. So you don't think about the little things, but sometimes your body might be changing, even if your environment isn't. It could be your brain. It could be physically your body is changing. It'd be a reaction time. You know, as we age, our reaction time, it declines. So that's something to think about when you're moving around is the time that it's going to take for you to process if you're, you know, starting to fall or if you're starting to have an accident, that the time it's going to take you to react appropriately, it may not be enough time anymore. So putting these strategies in place is really important. So obviously exercise and balance is going to be huge for fall prevention, especially with our elderly population, but doing things that they want to do and are motivated to do is going to help with that. Also, just ha- making sure, recommending like proper shoes and equipment, proper shoes is going to help. I've actually also gone with clients before to see orthotists and prosthetic to get that to help in their everyday life. And then a big area that we do as well is removing barriers from their environment. So we do a lot of home assessments as well if needed. So going into their home and making recommendations. So those barriers, if they can't clear their their shower tub or if there's a ton of rugs on the floor, things like that, there's recommendations we can make in that way to help prevent falls. If they're scared of falls, just also preparing them to know what are you going to do when you do fall or if you fall or when or if and ways that can help reduce injury in that case. And so they just feel more confident in their own abilities in that regard. But there's a lot of different yeah, angles you can go depending on the client. I've recently dealt with a lot of clients who don't, who lack that arch support, which causes kind of that flat foot effect and can affect their, their gait or their walking. And so they compensate in other ways sometimes. So just a supportive shoe. Sometimes people, I know it gets hot in the summer and they wear flip-flops. That's going to actually be a huge deterrent if you already have balance issues or reduced strength. Really supportive shoes. I know New Balance is always a good go-to if they just want standard. I always recommend them, Mm -hmm. uh, at least with AFO braces, but that doesn't mean everyone gets them, right? Correct. Yeah. And that's another benefit of the New Balance is they, they do support orthotics or prosthetics if if needed so yeah it's amazing to me how many shoes are not made for in my opinion for the human foot you take the insole out of your shoe and you look at it and then you look at your own foot and you're half the time you're going to be like how do i ever even wear this shoe at all do you ever teach people not that we ever want them to fall but if they did what they should do hundred percent. When I'm working with my patients, before they leave, we almost always want to make sure that they know how to get up from the floor. So we call it floor to share transfer. So we usually try to teach them how to, you know, crawl to a safe place, how to use a chair, a counter, something like that to get up from the floor. So basically what you would want to do is crawl to a couch, a chair, and get onto your hands on the chair onto your knees and then push yourself up as best you can into that chair. Just get yourself into a safe position. Would you ever tell someone not to do that? I can imagine someone fell and broke their hip. So then you have to make a decision kind of, especially if you live alone, right? Maybe that's time to use the necklace that you hopefully have on, right? Yeah, Yeah, or even a cell phone. You know, I always tell my Uh, patients, keep your cell phone in in your pocket or they have little bags that you can put your cell phone in and you don't sure. typically have big enough pockets like I know us girls never do. So sometimes I recommend just kind of an around the neck, almost like a lanyard with a pocket for your cell phone just to keep it close. Because yeah, if okay. you feel pain when if you start crawling or if you start moving yeah. pain, I would not recommend, you know, moving. And again, you know, you want to seek medical attention and advice in these kind of circumstances because it's going to be a case-by-case basis. So if anybody's watching, if you have hurt yourself and you don't feel like you can crawl, you know, talk to your doctor about it beforehand. Really good idea. Don't just start crawling on a broken hip. When is that? Call 911. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's probably a tough call, but if you fall, some people might not realize how bad the fall was and then they should have called, but didn't, you know what I'm saying? So when you hit the ground, should you call every time? Or do you have any rules of thumb on that? I think if you're unsure, you should call. If you're in pain, definitely call. 
there could be something else going on. It depends where you land, too. Did you land on your head? Did you land straight on your back? Or did you land on your bottom? So I think those are important clues to to what's your next step. But especially if you're alone, I would I would recommend calling. You talked a little bit about equipment before. So one of the things that I want to learn about more myself is if someone falls, you know, is there a lanyard? Or I was talking to another OT that it was nice enough to do a video with us. And she was saying there's like alarm systems kind of in the home that you kind of speak to and it can call for help. Or is there some sort of necklace that you wear? I've seen you can keep around your neck if you feel comfortable doing that. The beautiful thing about phones nowadays is we have things that are our voice activated. So without even buying anything new, I could say, hey, Siri, and then you could instruct it to call for you if you're in a close enough distance. Most smartphones have that programming. So keeping your phone on you, some people do that around their neck, I'm noticing. Some people mm-hmm. don't. Some people say that's in the past. If someone was a fall or, or worried about falls, what would you tell them to do with their phone around their neck or whatever they want? Because if they fell on their side, you know, they could crack the phone. I would recommend, and I think this goes person by person as well, usually keeping, I keep it in my pocket, in my back pocket, but I would recommend having them keep it on them. If they're worried about the fall, falling on their phone or something like that, they do have those devices where it's just a one click button. It's just something you could keep in your pocket or around your neck and it's just one button and that alerts a company that will send out. Or Sometimes they call to that device to kind of talk to them, but most of the time it just sends out an alert. I'm starting to see more online. And I don't know if you teach on this, if that's an occupational therapist role, but they're saying ways to fall. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like there's best practices, you know, something along those lines. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah. I think OTs can give education in this regard as well, especially just to boost the confidence. I work in with individuals who have sustained brain injuries. So I would personally say to protect your head. (laughs) And I think a lot of people would agree with me. I think that's that's precious material up there. So um, if you can, if you can avoid hitting your head or kind of just protecting your head, that's something I would recommend. You're supposed to stay loose. You're not supposed to tense up. And they say that with car accidents too, the people who are sleeping do much better uh, than the people that tense up because you have a bigger chance of injury with breaking bones and things like that. So is there an order of operations, if you will, if someone falls, what should they do first, second, third? Do Do you get that detailed in helping people? Definitely. Yeah. And I'll kind of skip over the first part where you're more assessing to see if what you should if you should call and and wait for people to come help. But if you if you feel confident or you're with someone who feels confident that you're OK to continue to get up from your fall, we do educate on that. Would you kind of like me to go through the steps? Please. Yeah. Okay. I mean, if you think it's going to help people. Yeah. What we encourage is for people if they can. And I know this can be hard if they have reduced strength, but you want to really get in to what we call a quadrupad position or like a crawling position. So on all fours. So say you fell on your back and there's no sign of other injury. We'd we'd encourage you to kind of roll onto your side and then kind of roll over into that quadrupod position. So I don't know if you've done like cat cow in yoga. So you're in that right before you do cat cow, you're in that crawling position. So from there, you really kind of need to get buy almost some kind of furniture to help you for this next step. So if someone's there, hopefully they can bring a chair over. Um, If you're alone, you may want to crawl to a couch or a chair, and that's going to give you kind of that step help that next step to get yourself back up. So when you're close to the chair from there, you can use the bottom of the chair, the base of the chair to kind of start to push up from. Yeah. And then you want to bring one of your legs up into a 90 degree angle. So you'll have the support of your two arms on the base of the chair. And you should have one leg, if you're able to do this, one leg kind of at a 90 degree position. And with those three points, kind of push yourself up and then kind of swivel onto the chair. I would imagine you'd want to get onto the chair just to then assess if you're dizzy. Or would you think that? Yes. You do not want to stand up from there. You want to, again, kind of assess before standing up. Definitely. Okay. I'm just going to start from the This is what I mean by quadrupod position or the crawling position. 
And so you don't want to use a rolling chair, which I have, because that can slide away, right? And then you can become unbalanced again. But say this is your kitchen dining chair with four legs. (laughs) And no wheels. Correct. Um, So once you get by that, you should be able to use one of your arms to kind of start to kind of gain some some upward mobility and then you bring the leg one of the legs to 90 degrees okay from there you have three points to kind of help push you up and again Uh, don't you don't want to go all the way up you just want to kind of get into that spot do you talk with patients about shoehorns ever and different kinds of shoehorns yes yeah so we use long handled shoehorns wide shoehorns a lot especially we have a lot of patients on precautions in the hospital as well um, so if you break a hip or if you hurt your back, then you're not allowed to bend in certain ways. Gotcha. Um, so we do talk about, yeah, shoot horns for sure. So long handle, short handle. I love this one for people that struggle with their hand control. It's like a clip shoe horn that goes on the back of the shoe. Do you ever use those at all? So we do not have them at our facility, but I show them to patients a lot because I have um, seen them in the past that they've made a huge difference because sometimes, you know, depending on your shoes, the shoe horn of one style may not really get the back of it out. But the nice thing about that little clip is that it opens it up to begin with. It goes all the way around the back of the, of the shoe. So that, yeah, that is a really nice tool nice option so then you don't have to hold it i guess is all i'm saying it's right which is, which is good if the hand strength isn't what it used to be when you were 20 so or if you can't bend down i mean you know back flexibility can decrease as you age as well especially if you hurt your back yeah for sure adaptations in the home anything for the bed uh, that you could talk about bed mobility is super important the height of the bed can be a factor If a bed's too low, just like a toilet, this is going to make it very difficult for someone who has reduced strength to get out of it. Or like you said, like they do have things you can put on the side that can help with that, that push up, that transfer to get out of the bed or to help them to get to the side of the bed. What about lighting? When you go into somebody's home, do you educate on lighting? Yeah, we definitely check for adequate lighting, especially in the bedroom and the bathroom, because it's very frequent that people get up in the night to go to the bathroom and without lighting they could easily trip on shoes or something and you're also waking up from almost a a days a different state so that can also add to how maybe good your balance is at that time so they do have sensor detected light lighting that you can easily put in on the wall adding lamps those are definitely recommendations and things we look for so when you talk about sensory, this is my hitch with this. So sensory, that that kind of lighting, I can just imagine rolling over a bed and the light goes <laughs> off. You get so irritated, right? Mm-hmm. Are, are there certain areas that are best for that, like in the hallway maybe? Or what do you think on that? Yeah, I think it's usually in the hallway. And you can also, it won't necessarily go out. Like you could have it at the lower hallway where it just senses if someone walks by, not necessarily from like a top view that sees everything, every motion that you do. So that's a, that's a great point. Gotcha. So on the ground, that kind of, that's good. Uh, one of the occupational therapists that I was talking to, she was even talking about the clapper. I actually had you guys one that. I mean, it sounds perfect for this scenario. I've had one. I don't think they work great. I, I will say oh. it's, <laughs> especially if you have a partner, do you want to be <laughs> yeah. or a significant other laying there? You want to be clapping in the night. It could be something as simple as a touch touch lamp next to your bed or um, gotcha. once you push on. Yeah. Can we talk about some assistive devices? I know occupational therapists are known for helping people put on AFOs. Mm-hmm. Do you ever dispense walking chains and walkers or is that more of their physical therapist's job? That's usually more PT for the assistive devices. But something that I think is important that an OT might do is preparing those almost tutorials or step-by-step. And for people who are maybe cognitively impaired or may not remember the steps, kind of educating on how to do that, but also providing those that information for a later date, whether it be in a video or something they can have on their phone to watch how to put it on or a handout with visuals and writing, however the person learns best. So I think that's a big area too that I think a lot of healthcare providers do work on, but that is also an area that we like to be prevalent. Yeah. 
if you want a cane or walker, it's usually going to the physical therapist to get that kind of thing. But the problem I find is people either use them in the wrong hand. Can you talk about that? And then also the height of those things. People screw that up a lot and mm-hmm. it's nothing. It's not me saying it personally. I'm just saying, let's try to do better. And can you talk mm-hmm. about the height of these things? I just want to say that hopefully any healthcare provider that may see an issue or a need for a cane or assistive device will make the referral and the doctor will give the script and it would proceed like that. But yeah, I feel like I've seen that as a lot as well of different, the wrong heights. But if it's the wrong height for you, that side of your body will compensate almost to, to work for that height. So say I was using a cane and it was too high for me, my shoulder, my, my, le- my, my, my right side of my body is going to compensate and that's going to throw off your your gait and your body and your alignment in different ways, especially over time. So I don't think people think about that. And I don't think I would either if I wasn't in this field. I would say this is definitely like more of a PT's area, but it's something that we're educated to spot and to refer to sure, uh, or to give a referral to. So just something to think about how it can affect you long term. Do occupational therapists, do they make these sockings or is that a prefabricated thing you just get on online? Usually they're purchased online, but OTs are known for being very resourceful. I know we had a class where we had to try to make all the adaptive equipment um, because sometimes you want to just have it on hand and some people may not be able to afford all these things you're recommending. So that was actually one I did and I made it out of like a a detergent bottle and some rope and, but usually you buy them, (laughs) but it's possible. So the sake, Um, can you discuss what that is to people that might be interested? I mean, it, it, the word, the name gives it away, but can you talk a little bit more about the process? So sake essentially is this plastic, device and it's attached to usually two pieces of string would be recommended to someone who may have back pain or issues bending down or can't reach their their feet to put their socks on or if they're not able to bring their foot up either which is very difficult you need to have some good range of motion in your hips so you would it's something you can do just sitting on the side of your bed or in a chair if you had the sockade in one hand you would apply the sock onto it and then you could just with your two ropes while holding onto them. And then with your foot, you would be able to put it into kind of the plastic device with, that the sock is covering. And then you what would kind of just- Onto the sock? What holds the sock on? So that's a, a plastic piece. And usually at the very end, it's almost like a, it's not sandpaper, but it's something that kind of holds onto it over the heel. As you continue pulling, it gets over the heel and then it comes out. What about long-handled shoe horns? Is that something an OT rarely recommends or usually recommends or? Yeah, very similar. They usually go hand in hand unless you have more of a slip-on shoe, which we wouldn't recommend because it may not, if you're a fall risk or a person who is worried about falls, you should probably have supportive shoes that are tighter and aren't slip-on. So if you can't, again, like bend over, have back pain, don't want to bend over, because that will ignite that back pain. This is something that you would be able to do, again, sitting from the side of your bed or in a chair to be able to get your shoe on. So I hope that you liked something that you've seen in that particular video or heard. Now, just remember, some of the great stuff that I think that's in that video can pertain to your life as well. Just remember, if you go to an occupational therapist, maybe you get a walking aid of some kind. Even if they don't give it to you, they can actually create tutorials for you, for your walking aids of any kind, even if they didn't dispense it to you talks about an important potential aid that could help you in your future as well called the sock aid. And we're going to show you more videos on that later. And you may want to go back through this with your notes or just think about it right now and write this down as well. Think about the activities that you do every day or that you want to do better and write them down. So like cooking. Yeah, I have trouble cooking when I'm trying to stir the ingredients or when I'm trying to knead the dough or whatever the case is. Write some of these things down and occupational therapists can actually help you with that. They can help you with ideas in the grocery store, cooking, cleaning, driving, getting in and out of the bathroom, the shower, etc. So those things are all valuable for you and don't overlook the significance of them. Don't devalue them just being a simple little topic of conversation. This is your life and you can actually do something with the knowledge that an occupational therapist can help you with. 
Also, an occupational therapist can work on ways for you to get up the best way possible, even if you do fall. They talk about shoehorns. The clip shoehorn is a great one, and we'll show you a picture of it here. A, sh a clip shoehorn can help you with an AFO. It can help you with just shoes in general. It's something that doesn't require your active hand movement in order for you to benefit from it. So a clip shoehorn goes on the back of your shoe, and that way you can more easily get into the shoe or use the clip shoehorn to help you use the AFO with the shoe as well. Also, fatigue planning can be really important for someone. Rachel, at the very end of her video there, she talked about fatigue planning and know where your breaks are. All of those things are important for you. In our next section, we're going to be meeting with Brittany. Brittany has a lot of videos she's done with us, and think about what she's saying. Take some notes on this. She talks about a lot of different things, shower chairs, shower benches, so many of the things that could be valuable for you, and I wouldn't overlook just the importance of occupational therapists in your life. Even if it was just for one or two visits, that could be so much more than I can tell you 90% of the people are actually going to try to go out and get help with. Maybe just even if it was just one idea in your house that could help you, that could go the distance for you. You need just one distinction here or there that can help change the game for you, okay? I would at least get one visit from an occupational therapist, if you can, to help do a home assessment and just some introductory stuff that can help change your life. One of these falls just takes a few seconds, and if you can avoid it, it could, it could save you so much pain and misery that I'm trying to help you get ahead of this right now. So we'll see you in the next video with Brittany, and let's keep moving forward.